Side 1. Heroes and Villains, The True Story of the Beach Boys by Stephen Gaines. Copyright 1986 by the author. Narrated by Ray Hagan. This book contains 355 pages on nine sides. Annotation. A devastating portrait of squandered talent and ruined lives in the fast and loose world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Gaines outlines how the Beach Boys wrote and sang about the California surf, blonde women, and fast cars, but also lived a drug-clouded nightmare. Strong language and some descriptions of sex. 1986. From the book jacket. They were the West Coast's golden boys, the neighborhood kids who rode their California dreams out of the landlocked town of Hawthorne and swept over the country like a tidal wave. They were America's ambassadors of fun, 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 who sang the praises of a utopia where the surf was always up and the sun never set. In this electrifying account, best-selling author Stephen Gaines reveals the gothic tale of drugs, sex, music, greed, booze, and genius behind the wholesome image of the Beach Boys, America's oldest and best-loved rock group. Capturing the great moments of rock and roll history and its colorful characters over the past 25 years, Gaines profiles the heroes and villains who brought the California myth to its prominence. Gaines vividly portrays Brian Wilson, whose struggle to walk the line between unrivaled genius and utter madness drove him to spend over four years in self-imposed isolation. His brother Dennis, the unquenchable alcoholic and quixotic womanizer whose restless sexuality undermined five marriages and led him to welcome the entire Manson family into his home. The Wilson's cousin, frontman Mike Love, whose devotion to the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi could not quell his violent temper. Murray Wilson, the fifth Beach Boy, the abusive and tyrannical patriarch who started the band on its roller coaster ride to success and never let his sons forget it. The women who shared the Beach Boys' lives and dreams. The inside story of all those who were a part of the rock group that became an American institution. Through candid interviews with close family members, friends, and the Beach Boys themselves, Gaines recounts the multidimensional saga of the American dream come true. He shows how worldwide fame and enormous fortune, petty jealousies and undisguised greed, tore apart two families and led to violence, financial and personal ruin, even death, and reveals the surprising influences that set them on the road to redemption again. With page after page of new and fascinating revelations and dozens of vivid photos, many never before seen, Heroes and Villains is a sizzling expose that relives the life and times, the fun and excitement, the good and the gritty, and the great magic of the California surfer boys who shaped Rock's youth. About the author. Stephen Gaines is the co-author of the best-selling Beatles biography, The Love You Make. His other books include Marjo, the biography of evangelist Marjo Gortner, Me, Alice, the biography of Saturnalian rock star Alice Cooper, and three novels. A former pop culture columnist for the New York Sunday News, he continues to write profiles and entertainment articles for numerous periodicals. Narrator's Note Captions to photos found in the print edition will be found at the end of this recording. End Narrator's Note Dedication for Mom and Dad Introduction I was with Brian Wilson the first time he surfed. It was Father's Day, June 20th, 1976, a glorious summer Sunday on Trancas Beach, Malibu, half a mile from the Wilson clan's rented summer home. Standing by the edge of the ocean, Brian Wilson was a wondrous vision. Six feet three inches tall, weighing an imposing 240 pounds, he was dressed in a soft forest green terry cloth robe that flapped about his bare legs in the brisk June winds. His almost perfectly round belly, like a soft pink volleyball, swelled out from under the robe and was exposed to the chill late afternoon air. The wind blew his black hair away from a bearded, handsome, cherubic face. There was something mystical and childlike about him. He radiated an aura, a magnetic presence that drew people to him. He turned and looked out to the ocean, and the distance in his eyes made the expanse of the Pacific seem small. But those eyes... Those cold blue eyes were terrified. Brian Wilson was somewhere else, struggling hard to be in touch with what was happening on the beach, but from the other side of a psychic glass wall.
Brian Wilson is schizophrenic. As the producer-composer of the Beach Boys, Brian, along with his brothers Dennis and Carl Wilson, cousin Mike Love, and friend Al Jardine, had proselytized the legendary California good life around the world for 15 years. But for 12 of those years, Brian had been on a reclusive psychological odyssey. That Sunday in June was not only Father's Day, it was also Brian's 34th birthday and an unofficial celebration of his rebirth. Only eight months before, with the aid of Los Angeles therapist Eugene Landy, Brian had gotten out of bed in his $500,000 Bel Air home for the first time in four years and begun a daily routine of jogging, athletics, and sporadic trips to the recording studio. Brian was on the beach that day, along with a few family members and his therapist, to film a segment of an upcoming NBC TV special on the Beach Boys, The Beach Boys, It's Okay. The show was part of the general excitement about Brian's recent steps back to reality. Produced by Saturday Night Live producer Lorne Michaels, the special was a celebration of Brian's rebirth. I was invited to the beach that day as a journalist writing a story about Brian for New West magazine. To photograph Brian Wilson surfing was Lorne Michaels' Ne Plus Ultra irony. Brian Wilson had never surfed. Although the Beach Boys had sold an estimated 80 million records, 20 million of them with surfing as a major theme, and Brian had splashed around in the water with his brothers for publicity photos, he had never mounted a surfboard before. Indeed, photographing Brian in the surf was almost a cruel joke because Brian had a deep, abiding fear of the water, and in his childlike manner he would warble in a thin voice, The ocean scares me. Nevertheless, that day Brian would face the Pacific. The segment of the show opened with Brian lying in the bed to which he had retreated for so many years, a four-poster adorned with a headboard of carved angels. He was a huge whale-shaped figure under the blankets, with only his large bearded face visible and those small scared eyes blinking expectantly. Into the room, dressed in policemen's uniforms, strode two Saturday Night Live regulars, John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Belushi and Aykroyd presented Brian with a warrant for his arrest, charging him with never having surfed. They marched him down the curving staircase of the house and brought him to the beach in a patrol car with a surfboard attached to the roof. Now, with the cameras trained upon a terrified and wooden-looking Brian, the surfboard tucked under his arm, Belushi ordered, Let's go, Wilson, here's your wave. With his bathrobe still wrapped around him, Brian bolted into the water, the waves crashing around his corpulent body. For a fraction of a second he mounted the board on his huge belly, but the ocean quickly pulled him under, baptizing him. I felt the power of the sea, he later told me. It was cold, and I felt the sea begin to grasp me. His wet terry robe clung to him as he regained his balance. With a stunned and questioning look, he turned toward the cameras, hoping his ordeal was over. But the people on the beach only laughed and cheered and shook hands, paying no attention to Brian at all, and the cameras rolled on. So Brian, ever the trooper, turned bravely back into the surf, his robe falling away from him as he played farther into the icy water after his drifting surfboard. When he finally emerged from the water, his wife Marilyn shielded him from ungracious photographers as she toweled and dried her shivering husband. From that day on, my fascination with Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys grew to a passion. That summer I made three trips to California and spent nearly a month following the Beach Boys around, interviewing all of them at some length, including Dennis Wilson, Carl Wilson, Alan Jardine, and Mike Love. Mike Love not only consented to an interview, but even invited me to his apartment in Marina del Rey for a lecture and meditation session. I also interviewed Beach Boy's mother, Audrey Wilson, and was invited into Brian's home by his wife, Marilyn Wilson, for a long and candid interview. During those same weeks, I spent several days and evenings with Brian's therapist, Dr. Eugene Landy, in direct interview. Dr. Landy invited me and my tape recorder to remain with him in his office during a therapy session with Brian Wilson. Thanks to Dr. Landy, I was also allowed to interview Brian extensively and observe him in his private life, which included going bowling with him at Pico Lanes, jogging in Rancho Park, and attending with him various public events for the taping of the NBC TV show. The time I spent alone with Brian was the most exciting and valuable of all, and I am deeply grateful for this personal access. Brian is rawly honest and revealing, a child man, terribly vulnerable to journalists and strangers, 
alternately frightened and eager to please. At the beginning of our first interview, he stopped after just two sentences. I don't know why, he told me. I'm just thinking of ending the interview here and letting you write the story. But he didn't stop there. He stayed for that interview and several more, all of which are included in this book. Although in the preparation of Heroes and Villains, I have depended heavily on those initial interviews and tapes with Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys and their families, over a hundred new interviews were conducted exclusively for this book. To my great regret, several sources with first-hand knowledge of the Beach Boys' personal and business lives refused to be identified and would only agree to be interviewed anonymously. To these people I am indebted for their insight and for their massive contributions to this text. However, for this reason, I must also caution the reader that a character's inclusion or exclusion in a scene or event does not necessarily indicate that that person has contributed to this book. Fortunately, I am able to thank Brian Wilson's wife of nearly 16 years, Marilyn Ravel Wilson, for her time and trust in me and her tremendous help with this book, which included many hours of interviews as well as her endorsement of me to other participants. My thanks also to her sister, Diane Ravel, who worked and lived with the Beach Boys at Maryland's side, as well as to their mother and father, May and Irving Ravel. Their exhaustive interviews and kindnesses, including May's delicious chicken soup, are greatly appreciated. I am especially grateful to Karen Lamb for sharing her life with Dennis Wilson in over 25 hours of interviews, including access to personal diaries she scrupulously kept over the last 15 years. Carol Bloom, Dennis Wilson's first wife, for her long and candid interview. Barbara Charon Wilson, Dennis's second wife, for her exclusive interview and trust in me during the preparation of this book. Chris Cable, Dennis Wilson's personal assistant and dear friend, whose outspoken support has sustained me through many troubled times. Annie Hinchy Wilson, Carl Wilson's former wife of 14 years, for her interview. Jerry Schilling, Carl's personal manager, for his interview and Robert L. Levine, Dennis Wilson's personal and business manager, whose insights and information greatly enhanced the preparation of this book. Rick Nelson, Brian Wilson's personal business manager, was instrumental in my gathering substantial information for this book, as was Janet Lent Coop Nelson, former president of Brother Enterprises and Brian Wilson's co-business manager. Stanley Love, brother of Mike and Stephen Love, also helped to inform this book substantially as did his grandmother, Edith Clardy Love, and his father, Milton Love. I am indebted to Eva Easton and David Leaf for their support and kindness and for putting up with my early morning phone calls. Without their help and David's 1978 book on the Beach Boys, this book would have been a greater struggle. And to Peter Ream, whose Beach Boys archive is the finest in existence and who supplied many of the exclusive photographs used in this book. I would also like to thank, for their varied assistance and or interviews, many patient people, some of whom indulged me with two and three interviews, including Fred Vale, Van Dyke Parks, David Anderley, Gary Usher, Eddie Murado, David Marks, Nick Vinay, Rich Sloan, Chuck Kay, Tom Murphy, Kurt Betcher, Bob Merlis, Chris Clark, Steve Goldberg, Michael Moss, Colleen McGovern, Bill Oster, Bruce Morgan, Dorinda Morgan, Joel Moss, Carol Thompson, Joe Saracino, Bud Court, Ida Smith Kennedy, Bob Kennedy, Catherine Pace, Stephen Kalenich, Fred Morgan, Ben Edmonds, Gil Linder, Maggie Montalbano, Michelle Myers, Joanne Marks, Diane Croxy Adams, Rick Henn, Jeff Bolonsky, George Hormel Jr., Alice Fiondella, Carol Thompson, Mike Klempfner, Tony Martell, David Oppenheim, Chip Racklin, Gail Bookhalter, Andy Goldmark, Brenda Lewis, Michael Vossi, John Hanlon, Connie Pappas Hillman, David Elliott, Stephen W. Despar, Tony Asher, Nick Grillo, Stanley Shapiro, John Vincent, Greg Jacobson, Ginger Blake Shackney, Tandon Almer, James Riley, Renee Pappas, Christine McVie, Richard Durier, Rusty Ford, Peter Marshall, Keith DeVoe, Brad Elliott, Stephen Korthoff, Charles Wilson, Jean Wilson Torbett, Rocky Pamplin, and Nancy Rosenthal. My thanks to my attorney and friend David Hollander and to Bruce Roberts and his family who gave me shelter and comfort during my long sojourns in Los Angeles, as did E.J. Oceans and Stephen Poe. My gratitude also to Bernie Berkowitz. 
Finally, I would like to thank my agent, John Hawkins, my editor, Michaela Hamilton, for her encouragement and guidance, my wonderful publisher, Elaine Coster, for her faith in me, and Joseph Olshan, who put up with this all over again. Stephen Gaines, Wainscott, New York, 1986 Chapter 1 1. It was a surfer's dream. It was just after dawn on Santa Monica Beach, December 4th, 1983, a magnificent, clear and cool winter Sunday morning, the kind of day when the Pacific is cold, but the surf is up and the waves sweep to the beach in perfect breakers, and no intrepid surfer can see the ocean without a sigh. But on this day, Dennis Wilson, a surfer since he was ten years old, hardly noticed the Pacific at all. It was the morning of Dennis Wilson's thirty-ninth birthday. Dressed in green army pants, t-shirt, and flimsy jacket, he had just sleepily hitchhiked his way from a friend's house to the Santa Monica Bay Inn, a beachfront motel. Here, his estranged nineteen-year-old wife, Sean Love Wilson, lived with their fifteen-month-old son, Gage, in a one hundred twenty-five-dollar-a-week kitchenette. Dennis intended to pay them a surprise visit, but it was he who was in for the surprise. He was about to find his wife asleep in bed, fully clothed, with two men. The Bay Inn, as it is called, is a large three-story motel with a hundred units. Facing the beach, with a breathtaking view of the Pacific, it boasts a raised swimming pool area fenced against the ocean winds by clear fiberglass. Located just two blocks south of the Kearney-like Santa Monica Pier, and not far north of the drug-ridden artist's beach community of Venice, the Bay Inn, with its reasonable rates, drew a transient crowd of young residents, attracted as much to the area's drug activities as to the year-round beauty of Santa Monica Beach. The strip of motels and hotels, from the Sheridan on Wilshire Boulevard all the way south to Pico, was part of what the local hotel people called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which ran all the way from Florida, fed by Interstate 10. If you were poor or drunk or drugged and hitchhiking across America looking for the Pacific, Ocean Boulevard in Santa Monica is where you'd come out. It was not exactly where you would expect to find Dennis Wilson, a man known for his expensive taste and style, his Rodeo Drive wardrobes, his Ferraris and Rolls Royces, and his six-figure income. The drummer and middle brother of the Beach Boys, Dennis Wilson had for two decades been the personification of American virility and daring do. It was Dennis who embodied the spirit of the Beach Boys to tens of millions of teenagers around the world. He was the epitome of the surfer playboy. Over the years, he had, much to his own pleasure, developed a reputation as one of California's most notorious symbols of wanton lust and overindulgence, the rock and roll James Dean of a generation raised on free love and fast cars. Mischievous and fun-loving, he was the group's sex symbol. A ruggedly good-looking man, he had been muscular and tanned year-round from surfing and working on his boat. His thick brown sun-crested hair, parted down the middle, framed a strong bearded face. His blue eyes twinkled coyly, and his quick smile was not so much crooked as it was a devilish sneer. Men felt instant comradeship with him. Women found him irresistible. Dennis's ineluctable appeal had its spoils. From the time he was twelve years old, he bragged, girls were lining up to sleep with him, and he turned down not a single one. Indeed, Dennis was as addicted to women as he was to his other vices. He was obsessed with sex. Getting laid was a major preoccupation for him. He called himself the wood, because he was always hard and ready. Although he had been married five times previously, and was father to five children, throughout all his marriages he had countless affairs, daily, including one with Patty Reagan, the president's daughter. He had recently ended a turbulent three-year liaison with Christine McVie, the singer-composer of the English rock band Fleetwood Mac. His best-known and most publicized marriage was to the beautiful blonde actress Karen Lamb, whom he married not once but twice. It was a marriage straight out of the pages of People magazine. Together they were the perfect gleaming vision of a California couple, young, rich, and famous, whizzing down the coast highway in one of their matching Ferrari convertibles. But if Dennis was every teenage Walter Mitty's fantasy of the California playboy surfer, the Dennis Wilson who hitchhiked to his beloved beach on his thirty-ninth birthday was not the same young stud revered around the world as the essence of the California myth. He could easily have been mistaken for a man a decade older. 
Instead of the muscled and tanned athlete familiar to his fans, he was pudgy and overweight, bloated with edema from drink and drugs. What had once been the brine and vigor of sailing in the outdoors was now the gray of heroin and cocaine. His bearded face was lined, his eyes puffy and bloodshot. He spoke in a roaring, rasping voice, worsened by several operations to remove polyps from his vocal cords and the consumption of at least two packs of Lark or unfiltered Camel cigarettes a day. Over the years, in various alcoholic accidents, he had cut or broken almost every appendage of his body, and everything ached. And if you looked carefully, in his eyes you could see a deeper damage than that self-inflicted by drugs or booze. Dennis was being eaten away. His recent marriage to Sean Love had only worsened his problems. Sean was a round-faced, doe-eyed, blonde teenager with a shag haircut and a pug nose. In a Byzantine twist, Sean was the illegitimate daughter of Dennis's first cousin, the Beach Boys' Mike Love. She had been conceived in a one-night liaison with then-secretary Shannon Harris and subsequently born out of wedlock. Her mother had sued Mike Love for paternity in Santa Monica Superior Court two decades ago. Sean reportedly won an award of $300 a year in child support and the right to use the name Love when she turned 18. Her father shunned her most of her life, and she and her mother appeared to remain very bitter toward him. Some would say they harbored a vendetta against the Beach Boys. To make this volatile situation even more explosive, Dennis Wilson and Mike Love despised each other. Since they were children, there had been a hostile and open rivalry between Mike and Dennis that even led to public fisticuffs. Eventually, a mutual restraining order was obtained in court to keep them apart. Mike, it was said, resented Dennis's image as the group's sex symbol. He considered Dennis a child, overindulged and uncontrollable, yet adored by all the Beach Boys' fans and always forgiven by an indulgent family. Mike, by contrast, was a hard-working, competitive man, a devout vegetarian and transcendental meditator who never drank or smoked. Dennis, naughty child that he was, goaded and provoked Mike at every turn. Once, on the Beach Boys' private plane, Dennis raced over to a small compartment where Mike was meditating, ripped open the curtain, and vomited in front of him. On another occasion, on stage at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, Dennis flicked off Mike's omnipresent cap to uncover his balding pate in full view of the audience. Dennis also enjoyed taking various young women into the meditation room in the Beach Boys' privately owned recording studios and making love to them on the floor. Later, when Mike arrived to meditate, the room was often fragrant with spent passions. Indeed, for Dennis to have married Mike's illegitimate daughter could be seen as nothing but the most bitter spite work. Yet few would deny that Dennis sincerely fell in love with and felt sorry for Sean. She was only fifteen when she first started living with him in a small house on Wavecrest Avenue in Venice Beach. Dennis swore at first that the relationship was not sexual, that he was just helping straighten out a mixed-up kid by putting her up in a room in his large house. But soon they were sleeping together, and not long after she was pregnant. Dennis called two female friends to ask where Sean could have an abortion, but reportedly she refused, and Gage was born on September 3, 1982. Dennis married her nearly a year later, on July 28, 1983. From the start, it was obvious that Dennis and Sean had come from two different worlds and would have a hard time getting along. Sean was used to scraping along with very little money, and she guarded every penny. Dennis, on the other hand, was famous for his prodigious spending. When she tried to instill her frugality in him, violent arguments ensued. One of the couple's close friends described the marriage as one big fight. Screaming and punching matches were not unusual. The past November, one argument culminated with Sean driving her silver BMW automobile right into the front door of their rented Trancas Beach house. On the wall of the house, scrawled in crayon, were the phrases, No love and no respect. Dennis would often call his friends or manager and complain, What am I doing with her? She's such a kid. They had filed for divorce in November, not even four months married. During the short time they were officially husband and wife, Dennis continued to see other women on the sly, but he remained sexually faithful to Sean as he saw it by only allowing himself to get blowjobs, and thus avoiding the possibility of contracting a venereal disease. Such loosely defined fidelity did not work both ways in Dennis's chauvinistic rulebook. 
The thought of Sean with another man was something his fragile ego could little deal with, and of late Sean had been friendly with a young man in his early twenties named Brant, not his real name, of whom Dennis highly disapproved and was violently jealous. Yet through all the torment of the relationship, and even with their divorce impending, Dennis could not bring himself to stay away from her. Their infant son, Gage, kept him coming back over and over again. Dennis loved and adored this tow-headed, precocious little tot, whom he had come to visit that early December morning at the Santa Monica Bay Inn. As he made his way up to room 353 of the motel's north wing, Dennis did not stop at the front office to phone ahead, because the management had already thrown him off the premises on several occasions. And anyway, most of the time when he called the room, Sean wouldn't take his calls, and then he was left arguing with the operator. Already the switchboard had logged dozens of pleading phone calls to Sean, which she had refused to answer. Yet Dennis needed to see Gage with an uncontrollable passion. Gage seemed the only constant in his life, the only living thing he could hold on to. Of course, Gage could hardly talk, but with him there was no hurt, just simple, uncomplicated love. In a way very few people understood, Dennis needed the baby more than anyone in the world needed him. Dennis would replay over and over again for friends the scene that greeted him that morning in Sean's room. According to Dennis, when he entered the room, he found Sean asleep on the bed with two young men, one of them her steady boyfriend, the other a relative stranger to Dennis. All three were fully clothed, and it appeared they had innocently fallen asleep together. Sean's boyfriend, Dennis claimed, was a heavy drug user, and Dennis had complained many times to friends and business associates that Sean was involved in the use of hard drugs. Gage, with his golden white hair and angel's face, an active and inquisitive infant, was wandering around the room unattended. What the fuck is going on here? Dennis rasped, rousing the threesome from sleep. When he screamed with his hoarse throat, it was like a great lion's roar. What are you, fucking crazy? he shouted to Sean. Before the occupants of the bed could compose an explanation, Dennis went berserk and began ripping apart the hotel room. He turned over furniture and punched holes in the door and walls. While all four screamed at the top of their lungs, Sean, with an incessant chorus of, Get out! Get out! A tug of war ensued over Gage. Dennis reportedly threatened to have Gage legally taken away from Sean because she was consorting with drug users. The frightened child shrieked hysterically while Dennis threatened to call the police and have them all arrested for possession of narcotics. Then Dennis suddenly snatched Gage away from Sean and raced out of the room with him. With the child howling and squirming in his arms, Dennis flew down the three flights of steps, past the pool area, and out of the motel onto Ocean Park Avenue. Darting in and out of traffic, he ran pell-mell across the broad, palm-lined boulevard and took shelter in a cool, dark bar called Shea Jays. Located almost directly across the street from the Bay Inn at 1657 Ocean Park Avenue, Shea Jays was one of Dennis's favorite hangouts. A small and quiet bar, its interior was lighted mainly by multicolored Christmas lights strung along the ceiling down the center of the room. The owners and employees all knew and liked Dennis, and Alice Fiondella, Jay's mother, who owned a small hotel next door, was there that morning with the cleanup crew when he came in. Dennis, who was frantic and near tears, told Alice he needed a taxi to take Gage to a friend's house. Alice called one for him while he tried to calm Gage. After a while, he laid the infant down on a maroon Naugahyde banquette beneath a red and white checkered tablecloth. It was cool in the dark bar. Dennis took off his jacket and wrapped it around his tiny son, who shortly fell asleep. While Dennis waited for a taxi, he sat in the booth next to Gage and nursed his vodka and orange juice, which he often carried with him in a pint bottle. Ironically, this morning's events were no special trial for him. In fact, they seemed like just another thread in the incredible tapestry of his life. As he sat at the table, the past few months fell heavily on him, and he began to weep. 2. Since early November, when his household possessions were cleared out of a rented beach house in Trancas and put into storage, Dennis had had no real place to live, no special place to stay, and probably not more than ten dollars in his pocket at any one time, if that. It was impossible for him to have any money, because he had virtually no control over his spending. He was nearly half a million dollars in debt, and the stories of his squandering were legion. Each friend had a favorite. 
Dennis orders a Rolls Royce over the telephone and destroys it in a drunken traffic accident the same night. Dennis picks up the $600 restaurant tab of five virtual strangers. Dennis allows anyone who takes his fancy to move in with him, rent and telephone free, including at one point the entire Charles Manson family. Dennis pours a bottle of honey all over a table in a restaurant and then tips the waiter a hundred dollars to clean it up. If he had a thousand dollars in his pocket, one of his ex-wives said, he'd spend it. There was no way to impress Dennis with the stupidity of his largesse, even as he teetered on the edge of bankruptcy. He had borrowed so much money from his mother that even she was turning him down. It's hard to imagine Stephen Love, Dennis's cousin and one-time Beach Boys manager, told a reporter that anyone could just blow so much money, but Dennis did. He was totally unrestrained and undisciplined. He was foolishly, self-destructively generous. His personal and business manager, Bob Levine, who had handled his finances since 1978, tried his best to rein Dennis in, but it was like trying to tame a bucking bronco. Levine, along with others, had begged him to stop spending and drinking, promising to guide him back to financial solvency if only he cleaned up his act. Levine diligently set up an extensive fiscal plan for Dennis, with a timetable and an arrangement for him to pay off his enormous debt, which included two years of back taxes and interest, numerous personal loans, unpaid insurance policies, and various child support payments. But it was no use. Every time Dennis promised to control himself, the promise would be broken an hour later. By that autumn, 1983, his drinking problem was threatening his health. He had tremors from the moment he woke up, and recently in Malibu, where he had a charge at the local supermarket, he had had to go out into the parking lot and drink two cans of beer before he could stop shaking enough to sign his name to the charge slip. He had had dozens of alcoholic accidents, including one in which he dropped a glass bottle of sparklets water that sliced open his foot so deeply the tendons had to be sewn together. Subsequently, all his toes moved in tandem. Dennis's driver's license had long since been revoked. All his friends assumed he had stopped driving because of his constant drunkenness, and Dennis let them think it. But the real cause was the alcoholic seizures and blackouts he had begun to suffer over the past year. That summer, while driving on Malibu Coast Highway with Gage in the car, he had blacked out, wrecking the car and nearly killing his son. After that, he swore never to drive again. But even the seizures and near-fatal accidents didn't seem to slow him down. There was something so eminently likable about Dennis that it was hard to be angry with him for long. He was a puppy who would not listen. But by now, the rest of the Beach Boys were exasperated with his behavior. Since they were a family unit first and a band second, they were especially close. As Dennis once put it in his inimitable way, we've done everything together, shit, eat, fart, cry, laugh, everything. But as much as they cared for him, he was twice as incorrigible, and there was growing concern he would drag the band down with him into scandal. The situation had come to a head in front of a sold-out crowd at the Universal Amphitheater in June 1979, when Dennis mumbled something into the microphone about cocaine and quaaludes. In a backstage squabble with Mike Love about the comment, Dennis was kicked in the balls. When the group returned to the stage, Dennis lost his temper, knocked his drums off the risers, and leaped across the stage at Mike Love in full view of the audience. He was officially thrown out of the group, fired by telegram until he obtained medical attention for his present condition, to which Dennis replied that no one could stop him from showing up. He arrived uninvited at a concert in San Diego, and the security guards held him outside as he forlornly watched the Beach Boys drive into the stadium in a long caravan of limousines. Dennis eventually talked his way inside, but he was barred from going up on the stage. When he was reinstated as a member of the touring group in the summer of 1981, the official dictum was that Dennis absolutely could not appear drunk on stage. To help him at least be sober for the shows, a team of bodyguard babysitters was hired to keep him from hitting the bottle for at least two hours before the show at a reported cost of $600 a day. They were there to lock him in his room, said Levine, beat him up if they had to, and physically restrain him. But Dennis always found a way to sneak the booze, usually aided by one of his alcoholic friends, the Lodies, they were derisively nicknamed, who were always around for the ride. One night, Dennis simply turned to his bodyguard babysitters and said, Enough! I'm smart enough to hire you guys, and I'm smart enough to fire you. Bob Levine took them off the job the next day. 
Everybody who cared about Dennis had tried at one time or another to get him to go for professional help. He tried Alcoholics Anonymous, but wouldn't go to regular meetings. He went to a few private therapists, including Don Jewell, who also worked with David Kennedy, Jr., but he always gave up after a few visits. Dr. Margaret Patterson, who had cured rock guitarist Eric Clapton of his heroin addiction, agreed to treat him, but Dennis never made an appointment. In one instance, the other Beach Boys asked Dennis to come to a meeting with them in Dallas, where there was a program for athletes with drug and drinking problems. He brought Gage with him to the meeting, and holding the baby in his arms, he told them, I appreciate what you guys are trying to do for me, but I have to do this myself. I will not talk about my personal life with a stranger. The rest of the group, in a gesture of support, rented a private jet plane at a cost of $5,000 and put it at Dennis's disposal to take him off to whichever center he chose to enter, but he never got on the plane. The group also flew Dennis and Sean to New York, all expenses paid, and put him up in the Parker Meridian Hotel in anticipation of his entering a clinic, but he never left the hotel. To make detoxifying even more attractive, they offered to pay him one-fifth of the touring money, even though he wasn't on tour with them, as long as he was in a clinic. Since the Beach Boys were commanding $50,000 a show, plus a percentage of the profits over that, it was a very attractive offer, but one that Dennis didn't take. Dennis would shake his head and smile sadly. I really want to clean up my act. I really do, he'd say, with that gorgeous earnestness, and I'm going to do it this time but this time never seemed to come. With all this support and concern, and with so much at stake, Dennis still couldn't find the strength in himself to detox. There was a part of him so tormented, so helplessly frightened and childlike, that he could not be reached. He always had an excuse for himself, but the most recent and heartfelt excuse was that he didn't want to leave Gage, especially alone with Sean. According to Bob Levine, Sean was an extreme detriment to these programs. That autumn, Dennis had tried to convince Sean to let him take the baby with him to a detoxification center outside of Phoenix, Arizona, called Cottonwood. Levine had made arrangements for the baby to stay in a nearby home with round-the-clock nurses who would bring the little boy to visit Dennis every day. Sean put up a big stink about it, Levine said, but then you could see her attempts to stop it were waning. She was going to let it happen and then all of a sudden she got fired up again. At one point, Dennis took Gage to the Los Angeles International Airport without Sean's knowledge. When Sean learned where Dennis had gone, she rushed to the airport and tried to get Gage back. A screaming fight over the child was conducted in the public terminal, during which Sean nearly bit off Dennis's thumb. The trip for rehabilitation was put off. The following month, Dennis actually managed to get to Cottonwood for several weeks. But he's the type who can't be alone, Levine said, so he kept calling Sean. She threw roadblock after roadblock. Sean reportedly encouraged him to return to Los Angeles, but Dennis didn't even have the money for a plane ticket, and, frantic to return, he convinced one of his well-meaning Lodi friends in Venice to send him the fare. When the lease was up at his Trancas house in November 1983, no substitute place was found for him to live. Levine says this was basically by his own choosing, because Dennis had promised to enter a detox center. When he finished detoxification, it was decided Dennis would be found a new house along with his new beginning. But that day never came, and by the morning of his 39th birthday, Dennis had grown resigned to drifting with no home, no money, and no transportation. 3. When a taxi arrived at Shea Jay's to pick him up that morning, Alice Fiondella thought she had seen the last of him. But over an hour later, he was back again, the cab driver at his side. Dennis was frantic. He had been all over the area looking for shelter, but no one seemed to be at home or willing to take him in. They had driven everywhere, Alice said. The driver took him all over. The baby had messed in the back seat, and there was no money to pay the fare. The cab driver, who felt sorry for Dennis, shook his head sadly, and Alice agreed to pay the fare. Dennis finally managed to reach one of his closest cronies, Chris Clark, on the phone. Chris told him to wait in the bar until he could borrow a car to come get him. Dennis sat in a booth, rocking Gage in his arms, while he waited for Chris to arrive. Dennis's little buddy, Chris Clark, was a Sancho Panza with whom Dennis could tilt at his alcoholic windmills. He was a pudgy, good-natured, loyal fellow, age 32, who was struggling with his own alcoholic problems. 
For the most part unemployed, he had been friendly with Dennis for the past several years in Venice Beach. Chris Clark adored and looked up to Denny as a kid looks up to a big brother. In awe of Dennis's sexual prowess, his fame, and his capacity for alcohol, Chris was ready 24 hours a day to gallivant with him. At night, they would often sit out on the beach together, getting drunk, staring up at the stars. You know what, little buddy, Dennis would tell Chris, pointing to the black sky littered with sequined stars. I've been there and back again. When Chris arrived at Shay Jay's shortly before noon, he was alarmed to find Dennis in tears. It just tore me up, Dennis told Chris. Sean was in bed with two guys, he said. Although when pressed, Dennis admitted that they were dressed and the situation did not seem of a sexual nature. Dennis thanked Alice and told her to call his business manager to get the taxi fare back. Then he and Chris went out of the dark bar onto the sunny boulevard and walked to the car Chris had borrowed. While Dennis was putting Gage in the back seat, he noticed that the 1982 silver BMW he had bought for Sean for $17,500 was parked in the lot next to Shay J's. Originally, there were two BMWs, twins, but Dennis's had been stolen in a parking lot during a concert. The sight of the BMW seemed to enrage him. Poking around in the back seat of the borrowed car, he found a baseball bat. Before Chris could stop him, he raced to the BMW and smashed out the front windows. Chris yelled, Whoa, Dennis, stop! But at the same time, he loved seeing him do it. Not surprisingly, nobody passing by on the street interrupted him at work with the baseball bat. When he was through, he seemed somehow relieved. Now she won't be able to come after Gage, he told Chris, and ordered him to drive off. After dropping Gage with friends in Venice who would look after him, Dennis spent the rest of his birthday cruising around with Chris in the borrowed car. At sundown, they drove to a palatial log cabin-style house at 14400 Sunset Boulevard that had once belonged to humorist Will Rogers. Dennis had rented this house in the late 60s while he was divorcing his first wife and money was pouring in. It was a period of wild abandon for Dennis, but it was also in this house that he had lived with Charles Manson and the family. It was an era of orgies and drugs, a time in his life he once said destroyed him. Yet he liked to return there. It was a way of revisiting some of his past glories, despite its associations, and it was with this idea that he directed his friend Chris Clark to drive there. The beautiful, heavily landscaped house on Sunset Boulevard was then occupied by George Hormel, Jr., the 56-year-old heir to the Hormel meatpacking fortune. Hormel had bought the house from its owner in 1968 for less than $500,000, and it was now worth nearly $3 million. The owner of a popular recording studio, Village Recorders, Hormel had been acquainted with Dennis for several years through the music business. They had first met many years before at Village Recorders, and then a few years later when Dennis brought Christine McVie over to show her the house. Hormel had grown fond of Dennis. He was just a big puppy, he said. Scratch him once behind the ears and he would follow you anywhere. Another year or so had gone by when, just that autumn, Dennis popped by unannounced and asked Hormel if he would work with him producing some tracks for an album. Dennis was very drunk and stoned, but after listening to the tracks, Hormel agreed to work with him. If you're straight, he admonished. Dennis became a frequent visitor to the house, sleeping there when he had no other place to stay, and Hormel had become one of the latest of a long list of people whom Dennis had come to depend upon for support. During that November and December, he and Dennis had exchanged nearly $5,000. He had accumulated four or five thousand dollars worth of debt for dope, and I don't know what else. I didn't ask, Hormel said, and I gave him the money. I made sure that it was to get people off his tail and not to buy more drugs. But by early December, Hormel wouldn't give Dennis any more cash. He wasn't getting it out of me. I was supporting him only as long as he was straight. In the month and a half that Dennis stayed at Hormel's, they had long conversations about Dennis's addictions and for a time Hormel believed Dennis was actually going to stop. Frequently they would stay up most of the night, talking into the early morning about Dennis's troubles. Hormel remembers that most of the conversations revolved around Dennis's personal problems with women and his family, and particularly his desire to end his alcohol and drug habits. Many times the conversations ended with Hormel convinced that Dennis was resolved to stop drinking. 
It was clear he couldn't go on as he was. Dennis's health had been deteriorating, and his epileptic-like seizures had increased. Hormel saw several of them during December. Dennis would suddenly fall to the floor, his eyes rolling back and churn convulsively. I witnessed a couple of real scary seizures, Hormel said. He didn't remember a thing when he came to, but he knew something had happened. The next day, another episode in the drama of his life would send him off center, and he would need another drink. Hormel wasn't surprised to find Dennis ringing the bell at the gate that December night. Hormel's son John was there, along with several friends and musicians with whom Hormel worked. When Dennis bashfully admitted it was his birthday, everyone made a big fuss over him, and they all went to the kitchen and baked a cake to celebrate. That evening, Dennis vacillated between bravado and sunken depression. At age thirty-nine, he saw the big forty and middle age coming up, and he knew he was getting too old to be a beach boy. But as soon as Dennis found himself becoming maudlin, he would catch himself and mask his mood with drunken gregariousness. He told several funny stories, acting them out dramatically in his big rasping voice. And at one point, Chris Clark said to him, "You know your problem is you're just mad you never made it as an actor. That's why you have to act everything out." Dennis grinned at him and said, "How did you know that?" They all sang "Happy Birthday," and Dennis became a little boy for a moment. Embarrassed and pleased and flustered when he blew out the candles. Later in the evening, they went to the billiard room and played pool. Dennis suggested they make the ante a thousand dollars a game, and everyone agreed because it was play money anyway. By the small hours of the morning, Dennis was blitzed on every accommodation of the household. George Hormel couldn't stand to see him that way, but instead of asking him to leave on his birthday, Hormel just locked himself in his study. In a few minutes, Dennis was banging on the door, asking to be let in, and the inevitable conversation followed. He loved Sean, but she was using drugs. He had to dry out, but he was just so lonely. He loved her. He hated her. He couldn't live without her. She was destroying him every minute they spent together. He stayed at Hormel's house that night and on and off for the rest of December, sleeping off his binges or just hanging out there during the day. It surprised Hormel that Dennis seemed to have not one penny, but he took it for granted that this lack of funds was part of the pressure Dennis's family and management were putting on him to detoxify. As the weeks passed, Dennis drank less, readying himself for another go at a detoxification clinic. But when Hormel returned home one night around the twentieth of December, he found Dennis on a wild, drunken binge. Getting blotto seemed to make sense to Dennis. Everybody goes on a last binge, he said. And then poured nearly an entire bottle of wine into the mixing console of Hormel's home studio. Hormel was exasperated. Ultimately, the truth hit home. If you gave Dennis shelter, you became part of the problem. Unable, in good conscience, to give him a home and booze to drink, Hormel had to ask him to leave. And by Christmas, Dennis was homeless again. Four. The impending holidays loomed like some nightmare for Dennis. Without a home, without a cent in his pocket, he felt lost and afloat. He crashed in cheap motels along the Ho Chi Minh Trail or at the apartments of friends. He made several attempts to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and the Beach Boys manager Tom Hewlett, in a gesture of support, accompanied Dennis to one meeting. But outside the meeting, the two argued about money, and Hewlett reportedly took a large roll of bills out of his pocket and offered Dennis fifteen dollars. Dennis was so insulted by the paltry amount he refused to take it, and Hewlett reportedly threw the money on the ground. Other reports say that the next day Hewlett broke down and gave Dennis a hundred dollars, but the money quickly went for more booze and drugs. At this point, Dennis was on the edge. He would either clean himself up and pull out of the nosedive, or else. Dennis was finally able to steel himself for the ride to a detoxification ward two days before Christmas. He said it didn't make much difference to him to be in a detox ward of a hospital on Christmas. He had no other place to go, and perhaps it was the best Christmas present he could give himself. On Friday morning, December twenty-third, Bob Levine drove Dennis to St. John's Hospital and Health Center in Santa Monica, only a mile from the Santa Monica Bay Inn. He was checked into the detox unit by Dr. Joseph Takamine, who headed the twenty-one day detox program. According to Dr. Takamine, Dennis was serious about the program and determined to stick it through this time. 
His blood test on admittance showed a .28 alcohol level and traces of cocaine. Dennis told the doctor he had been drinking about a fifth of vodka a day and using what he called a little coke. The doctor prescribed 100 milligrams of Librium every two hours so he could come down slowly and maybe start the program in five days. Takamin and Dennis talked extensively on Saturday, and the doctor told him their discussions would resume on Monday morning when the doctor returned to the hospital following a one-day Christmas break. All Christmas Eve day, Dennis suffered tormenting physical and psychological withdrawal symptoms cloaked by the 100 milligram doses of Librium. Itching to walk out, he spent the day obsessively making phone calls to friends, all of whom encouraged him to stick it out, promising to visit or call him whenever they were allowed. He reportedly called his brother Carl vacationing in Colorado several times, his mother Audrey and his brother Brian, but could not reach them. Only Bob Levine came by to see him that day. I brought him some presents, some necessities, toiletries, cigarettes, things to make the guy feel respectable. He was trying again, and then the siren called. The siren was Sean. Dennis had placed dozens of phone calls to Sean at the Bay Inn. She refused most of them until Christmas Eve, when she told Dennis that she and Gage were being thrown out of the Bay Inn for non-payment of rent. The manager said he had been given the runaround about payment for too long. Dennis would say Sean would take care of the bill. Sean would say Dennis would be by later to pay it. The physical damage Dennis had caused to the room was also a factor. Dennis became determined to leave the hospital and see Sean and Gage. Shortly after Sean's phone call, Dennis's friends Steve Goldberg and Denise Graves visited him in his room and encouraged him to stay, promising him that Sean and Gage would be all right. But by 3.30, Dennis was on the phone to his little buddy Chris Clark, telling him he was about to walk out of the hospital. He asked Chris to pick him up and take him out for a drink. Chris Clark was disgusted. He had no idea what to say to keep Dennis in the detox ward, so he hurried over to the hospital and offered to stay with him overnight. Dennis calmed down somewhat, and Chris slept on the floor next to Dennis's bed, talking him through the night. On Christmas morning, about 8.30 a.m., the hospital staff insisted that Chris leave. If I leave, he's not going to stay, Chris warned the nurses in the hallway outside of Dennis's room, but they insisted Dennis could not go through the therapy with a friend. Chris reluctantly went back inside the room to say goodbye. Immediately after Chris Clark left, Dennis called Steve Goldberg at least six times, demanding to be picked up at the hospital. Goldberg refused to be an accomplice in this self-destructive act. By noon, Dennis had walked out himself. From St. John's, he hitchhiked his way to his friend Nick's liquor store in Venice, where he begged a bottle and some cash. Then he went to Sean's mother's house on 12th Street in Santa Monica, where Sean and Gage were paying a Christmas visit. Reportedly, everything there was copacetic. He said he was really lonely and that he wanted to be with us on Christmas, Sean said. After an hour, he left to hitchhike his way to the nearest bar. Later Christmas night, John Hanlon, a recording engineer and one of Dennis's longtime friends, received a panicky phone call from one of Dennis's Lodi friends who said that Dennis was making a commotion at a club called At My Place in Santa Monica. Would Hanlon come by and help get him out of there? Hanlon, 27, loved Dennis. Dennis had given him his first break as an engineer at the Beach Boys Brothers Studios and had comforted him through many difficult personal times. He knew in what condition he would probably find Dennis, but went to get him nevertheless. Dennis was in the worst shape Hanlon had ever seen him. He was a total drunk, Hanlon said, disrupting business, yelling at patrons, screaming at the barmaids, trying to get up on stage, making a general mess of things. Hanlon managed to coax Dennis out of the club and drove him back to the Santa Monica Bay Inn, although Dennis kept insisting he be driven to George Hormel's house. I didn't know where to take him. I made a phone call to George, who said it's not a good time right now because I'm with family. Dennis was sitting in my car throwing booze all over, and he was making a mess, and I was getting real uptight. I said, look, I called Geordie for you, and there's nothing else I can do. I can't deal with this anymore. You've got to help yourself. Dennis said, nobody loves me, John, nobody. That's not true, Dennis, Hanlon told him softly, helping him out of the car. Everybody loves you, man. Too many people love you. That's your problem. I don't want to live another couple of weeks, Dennis said.
That's stupid talk, Hanlon answered. Dennis shouted, I'm not leaving. You're taking me over to Geordie's. He began to break the antennae off the car's hood and then tried to tear the door off the hinges. Hanlon screamed at him to stop. Seeing his words had no effect, he jumped behind the wheel and sped off, leaving Dennis standing on the street. Dennis stumbled across the road to Shea Jay's, and at about midnight he set out for the Santa Monica Bay Inn. When he arrived unannounced at Sean's room, she was there with her male friend. Dennis later told Chris Clark, Bob Levine, and others that he demanded to use the telephone, and Sean's friend wouldn't let him. A shoving match quickly escalated into a fistfight. Now came one of the craziest moments of the past few weeks. Dennis decided not to fight back. He simply made fists at his side to withstand the pain. He was so doped up from his hospital treatment, he felt very little of the serious damage being done to him by the repeated blows. Dennis said, I just stood there and let him hit me. I didn't do a thing. Severely beaten, he stumbled out of the motel room and walked down to Ocean Boulevard. He called Chris Clark from a phone booth and convinced him and Steve Goldberg to come get him in Goldberg's pickup truck. His friends found him bleeding from bruises on his face with scrapes on his forehead and one black eye, holding his ribs, drunk and sick. They took him back to St. John's, the hospital he had walked out of several hours earlier. On the way there, his complexion gray, Dennis told Chris Clark about letting Sean's boyfriend hit him. Chris couldn't help but laugh. That's the most destructive thing you've ever done, Chris told him. But Dennis was in no shape to laugh. I just want to go down there and kick his ass, he kept repeating. I'm going to call the cops, close the place down, bust everyone. That was Dennis's ultimate revenge, to call the police. But he could not bring himself to do it. Dennis had stopped hitting back. Inside the hospital, Chris Clark got Dr. Michael Gales on the phone and tried to convince him to readmit Dennis to the program, but Gales said he couldn't. He's just too much trouble, Dr. Gales reportedly told Clark. He might die, you know, Chris Clark said earnestly. He just stood there and got the shit beat out of him. He may have to die, the doctor allegedly replied. Chris Clark knew another doctor, Christopher Bader, at the Daniel Freeman Marina Hospital, who worked with drug and alcohol abusers, and called him to get Dennis admitted. Dr. Bader reportedly suggested that in order to restrain Dennis, the police lock him up, but Chris couldn't bring himself to call the police on his friend. By now, it was 2 a.m. on December 26th. Dennis was eventually admitted to the Marina Hospital that morning, and again, Chris Clark convinced the hospital staff that he would have to spend the night with Dennis in order for him to stay in the hospital. Chris slept on the floor until Dennis went off into a fitful sleep. But in the morning came the same hospital rules. Dennis had to see this through alone, and despite his repeated warnings that if Dennis was left alone he'd walk out, Chris Clark was made to leave the hospital. It wasn't 45 minutes later that Dennis started calling him. Where am I going to meet you, little buddy, he asked. Chris was adamant this time. He would not see Dennis any more if he walked out of the hospital. Next, Dennis called Steve Goldberg to pick him up, and Goldberg also refused. And sometime within the next hour, Dennis walked out yet again. He wound up at another favorite haunt in Venice, Hynano's, a dark bar with sawdust on the floor at the end of Washington Boulevard near the beach. There he got steadily drunk until 1 p.m., when again he called and asked Steve Goldberg to pick him up. Goldberg was busy tinkering with his van, and anyway, Hynano's was only a few blocks from where Goldberg lived. Why don't you just walk over here, he said. But Dennis was cantankerous and stubborn. He called Goldberg several more times that afternoon as he got drunker, demanding money and a lift. When it became clear that Goldberg wouldn't budge, Dennis got angry, ending the phone call with the word termination. Said Goldberg, I don't know if he was referring to the conversation, our friendship, or his life. 5. Later that afternoon, Dennis got in touch with a sometime girlfriend of his called Crystal, who had just returned from her Christmas vacation, and she arranged to pick him up. Born Colleen McGovern in Wisconsin, she claimed she was nicknamed Crystal when she worked as a Playboy bunny at the Lake Geneva Playboy Club. Dark-haired and pretty, she was full of the same kind of fidgety, nervous energy as Dennis. At the time, she lived in a furnished two-bedroom apartment in the Fox Hills apartment complex in Culver City with a female roommate and two pet birds. 
She had only recently taken a position of prominence in Dennis's life as a last resort for comfort, shelter, and a beer. She first met Dennis the Thanksgiving of 1981 at a party in Venice across the alley from a rented house where Dennis was living. Dennis was shyly sitting outside on the steps drinking, and she asked him to come in and have a plate of food. I asked someone who he was, and when I found out, I said, Oh, okay, forget about him. I didn't want to have anything to do with him at first. Too heavy for me. Yet in the coming weeks, she kept running into him, and eventually they struck up a friendship. We just hit it off, but I still kept my distance. He had Sean, and I had this boyfriend, so I didn't want to mess things up. But as time passed, and his marriage to Sean dissolved, his relationship with Crystal blossomed into a romance of convenience, and Dennis spent many nights at her apartment in Fox Hills. Crystal picked him up at Hynano's and took him to a payphone at the Fox Hills shopping mall. Realizing that all of his pals were burned out on his broken promises, aborted detox attempts, and drunken scenes, Dennis phoned an old friend from better times, Bill Oster. Oster, 44, was a mustachioed, weathered outdoorsman who owned a 52-foot yawl, the Emerald. The Emerald was kept in a berth at the Villa del Mar, a three-story white stucco apartment building and rudder and racket club at 13999 Marquesa Way, Marina del Rey, where Dennis had once birthed his favorite possession, the 62-foot sleek sailing boat he called the Harmony. The last time Oster had seen Dennis was 14 months earlier, backstage at the Greek Theater, where the Beach Boys were performing. Oster was surprised to hear from him after so long, but unpredictability was part of Dennis's charm, so when Oster heard his voice on the phone, now hoarser and scratchier than ever, he took it in stride. Pick me up at the Fox Hills Mall, Dennis ordered him, without saying hello. Just like Dennis, Oster thought. After all these months, he couldn't even ask, just kind of demanded. Oster first met Dennis in 1978, just as Dennis's second marriage to Karen Lamb was breaking up, and he was beginning to miss many tour dates. Dennis was living full-time on the boat, and he and Oster became close friends. Living on his boat was one of the best times for Dennis. He keenly loved the harmony, with its flashy hand-carved teak fittings and a beautiful carved golden teak pelican on the prow. Purchased years before in Japan, it had once been sunk and submerged, and Dennis had painstakingly refurbished it to its original beauty. But Dennis loved the harmony not so much for its physical beauty as for the total freedom it represented. Only the open sea was fierce and strong and unrelenting enough to be his full-time companion. The Harmony became Dennis's chief means of escape. Over the past few years, it was only on the Harmony that he was not in pain. He sailed it up and down the coast, or to Catalina, or to Hawaii, but mostly he just kept it berthed at the Villa del Mar, so he could stay close to his beloved ocean. Oster had gone on several trips with Dennis on the Harmony, and once, sailing up from San Diego, Dennis discovered a huge school of porpoises swimming and playing next to the boat. Exhilarated by the beautiful mammals, Dennis wrapped one hand in the mastings and hung over the side of the boat in the ocean breeze, serenading the dolphins with his harmonica as they popped up and down like corks in the rush of the wind and waves. But by the summer of 1981, the always erratic installment payments to American City Bank hadn't been made in several months, and one day, while Dennis was walking down the long wooden boat slip, he discovered a city marshal on board. Dennis didn't tell the marshal who he was. Instead, he got on Oster's boat across the dock and stood there, his heart breaking, as the marshal posted repossession signs, locked the door, and chained the Harmony to the dock. For a while, a marshal's representative lived on the Harmony until it was auctioned off for $53,000, half its worth. It tore Dennis up so much to lose his boat that Oster offered him the emerald to live on, and Dennis stayed there for a while, greeted with the empty slip of the harmony when he got up each morning. The slip remained empty to that very day. The Fox Hills Mall was a large shopping mall near the end of the Marina Freeway, about a mile from where Crystal lived. Around 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, December 27th, Oster and his fiancée Brenda found Dennis, dressed in army fatigues and T-shirt, waiting for him near a payphone with Crystal at his side. He looked pretty beaten up. There was dried blood on his ear, and he had scabs on his nose and forehead. His ribs ached terribly, he said. It seemed to Oster that Dennis already had quite a few drinks in him, but the first thing he asked for was to be driven to a liquor store. 
Oster tried to dissuade him, but Dennis complained about the pain in his ribs and said the liquor would be good for him. Oster relented. On the way to the dock, they stopped at Marina Liquors, where Dennis bought a bottle of the house brand vodka Del Rey. When Crystal and Dennis arrived at the Emerald, Dennis began drinking in earnest. None of the others drank, hoping to slow him down. They stayed up talking until midnight, trading stories about old times. Oster told Dennis, "It wasn't six months ago that I said to Brenda, 'I hope the next time we see Dennis, it's not at his funeral.'" Dennis looked Oster in the eye and said, "Don't you worry about that." Later, Oster told Dennis that by ironic coincidence, the Harmony, after it had been repossessed and purchased at auction, had been berthed by its new owner just the second dock down from where they sat. The boat had been for sale about six months ago for a hundred eighty thousand dollars, but now Oster heard it could be bought for a hundred fifteen thousand. Dennis thought the price was inflated. The boat needed a lot of work, but he would love to have it back. About midnight, Oster and Brenda went into the fore cabin and fell asleep. In the middle of the night, Dennis woke up and talked with Crystal about getting the Harmony back. He decided that was what he wanted more than anything just then. He told Crystal he intended to call Bob Levine in the morning and promised to present himself at any rehabilitation clinic the Beach Boys named if they would only help finance buying the Harmony back. This time he swore he was going to stop drinking. It was just that it was so damn lonely in those places and the shakes were so bad. Dennis talked about a crazy scheme of having Gage live with Crystal in an apartment near the detox clinic, so he could see them on visiting days. He wanted to be able to take someone with him that he loved and to be with them through this whole thing. Crystal said, "He knew he needed it, and he wanted to do it for his son and for the band." Most important to him, Dennis knew that in his impending divorce from Sean, there would probably be a custody battle for Gage. And he needed to be sober to prove he was a fit parent. Never needing much sleep, Dennis got up at 9 a.m. and looked around for his bottle of Del Rey vodka. The night before, Crystal had hidden it behind the trash bin in the galley so Dennis wouldn't find it. But he complained and moaned and searched all over the boat until he discovered it. He knew we were going to make it difficult for him, Oster said, but he also knew that we most likely wouldn't pour it down the drain on him. Because we did have some concern that if we completely dried him out, he would have a seizure. Oster and the women had coffee while Dennis fixed himself the first screwdriver of the day. Then the women went out for a shower in the dock facilities. By the time they got back to the Emerald, Dennis was excited and flying high. He said he had called Bob Levine to say he wanted the boat back, had to have the boat back, and that he was determined to sober up. He and Levine discussed a 30-day detoxification program in New Mexico and the possibility of his going back to Cottonwood in Phoenix. He made me a deal, Dennis said of Bob Levine. 30 days detox and you'll buy the boat back for me. He hugged Crystal and asked, "Do you want to live on the boat with me?" Crystal, taken by surprise, said, "What about Gage?" And Dennis said, "No problem, no problem. Gage too." This time he swore over and over again he would complete the program. He knew how important it was. Gage was at stake, and he sat around the floor of Oster's boat for the rest of the morning, talking about detoxing and pulling his life together, and how much he loved Gage. Oster suggested that he and Dennis put together a new rowing rig that Oster had purchased but never used. This project caught Dennis's attention for a while, and the two men assembled a small boat and went rowing around the marina. Dennis wanted to row across the marina to Aggie's Chris Craft. A large boat sales and repair shop, whose owner he knew. When Dennis owned the Harmony, he loved to hang out at Aggie's and frequently offered to buy the place from him. How much do you want for it? He bellowed to Aggie that morning. How much? Just tell me how much, and it's yours. A million dollars, Aggie said, smiling. And Dennis said, "Just call up my business manager, and he'll send it to you." They soon left Aggie's, and by noon were back at the Emerald. This time, the bottle had been hidden better. Dennis went through an elaborate search until he found it. He fixed himself another drink, and they all settled down to have lunch. Brenda made turkey sandwiches from Christmas leftovers, and Dennis talked again of getting the Harmony back. After lunch, Dennis spilled his drink all over his pants. Oster loaned him a pair of cut-off jeans that were slightly too baggy for him. Dennis rinsed out his stained pants and laid them on the deck in the sun to dry. Suddenly, Dennis said he was going swimming. "You're crazy," Oster said to him. And Crystal chimed in with, "Dennis, it's too cold." 
But Dennis went up on deck, and in another moment there was the sound of a splash as he jumped into the water. Oster decided he should go up on the dock to watch him. He found Dennis swimming around in the murky water of the empty berth once filled by the Harmony. The water was thirteen feet deep and hovering at an icy fifty-eight degrees. The most hardy swimmer would have needed a wetsuit, but Dennis just took a few deep breaths of air and then disappeared below the surface for what seemed like a long time. Oster grew worried, but in another moment he heard Dennis surface on the far side of the dock, laughing at having tricked him. Oster again tried to cajole Dennis out of the water, but Dennis only swam back over to the spot where the harmony had been berthed and began diving in earnest. On each trip to the bottom he found another piece of the harmony, sometimes only a small piece of junk, pieces of metal fittings and battery parts, and an old rotted piece of rope. After about twenty minutes he got out of the water to have another turkey sandwich. Inside the boat, as he started to eat his sandwich, he got the shivers. They put a towel on the floor for him so he could sit in front of the heater, but his teeth wouldn't stop chattering. He sat there sipping vodka and orange juice, trying to warm up, and whenever his back was turned, Oster would try to water down his drink. When Dennis caught on to what Oster was doing, he complained loudly, and sitting there on the floor, practically finished off the fifth. The whole time, he was talking about the big box he had seen on the floor of the marina where the harmony had been docked. I bet you it's a treasure chest. I know it is. It's a treasure chest with a bag of silver dollars. He entertained Oster, Brenda, and Crystal with the story of a submerged treasure, some of it a bag filled with silver dollars he had allegedly thrown overboard himself. None of them really wanted Dennis to go back in the water, but Dennis was intent on finding it. Oster complied by going to get a line of rope so Dennis could take it down with him and tie it to the big box he had seen. But meanwhile, Dennis, annoyed that the bottle had run out, had wandered off to find more booze. He walked a few berths down to the houseboat on which Lathiel Morris lived. Dennis seemed very excited, according to Morris. I'm getting my boat back, he bragged. Morris had his pretty sixteen-year-old granddaughter on board, and Dennis smiled and flirted with her. Dennis talked about his impending divorce from Sean, and Morris asked how many times he had been married. Dennis told him six. I'm lonesome, Dennis told Morris. I'm lonesome all the time. And Morris said, Ah, baloney, gesturing toward Crystal across the way on Oster's boat. Soon Oster went out looking for Dennis and caught up with him talking to yet another boat owner he knew from the marina, asking if there was any vodka to spare. Just as the man was about to hand over a half-filled bottle of vodka, Oster signaled frantically behind Dennis's back not to give it to him. The boat owner caught on right away and said, oh, Wait a minute, Dennis. He whisked the bottle back into the galley. A moment later he brought the same bottle back with much less vodka in it. Dennis thanked him and took it back to the emerald. Then he swigged it right down, not even mixing it with his usual orange juice. Almost immediately, Dennis insisted on diving again. Despite everyone's protestations, he jumped back in at the outward end of the dock and dived under the surface once or twice before disappearing for what seemed like a long time. Eventually, he surfaced close to the dock and handed Oster a rectangular object about the size of a book coated in mud. Dennis held on to the side of the dock with both hands while Oster rubbed off some of the muck. It was a wedding picture of Dennis and Karen Lamb in a sterling silver frame that rock manager producer James Gersio had given to them the first time they got married. Dennis had thrown it overboard in a fit of anger during their divorce. The glass was shattered, but in the faded water-bleached photo, Dennis was still tanned and handsome and young, and Karen was laughing, her baby blue eyes sparkling, and they were such a perfect couple it took your breath away. Oster called to his girlfriend, Brenda, come over here and see this. And then Dennis went back down again, down into the dark waters of the marina. Chapter 2 If there wasn't the Beach Boys and there wasn't music, I would not even know them, I would not even talk to them, but through the music I fell in love with my brothers. Dennis Wilson 1. Hey, Dennis, play it again, Murray Wilson roared from his bed. A great big bear of a man under the sheets, Murray loved bed. For Murray, bed was like a throne for a potentate. He would lie there for hours in the mornings, reading the papers, talking on the phone, watching TV, the bed sheets pulled halfway up his huge, rotund belly. He was a big man with a meaty face and a double chin. 
His thick brown hair was carefully combed back from a high forehead, and his half-framed mock tortoiseshell glasses sat across the bridge of his small, wide nose. His left eye, which he had lost in a freak industrial accident when he was twenty-five, had been replaced by a glass prosthetic eye that he kept in a container on the dresser at night. Even in bed, he smoked his omnipresent pipe. It jutted out from between his teeth, the bowl blackened and charred by the double kitchen matches he used to continuously light it. The smoke filled the room with a pungent sweetness that his family and friends associated with him. Occasionally, an ember would billow from the bowl and land on his chest, singeing the gray hair. "Hey, Dennis!" Murray bellowed again in his deep, sonorous voice, like the giant's voice in Jack and the Beanstalk. "Put it on again!" Murray had just listened for the tenth time that morning to Two Step Side Step, a composition he had written a few years before. By occupation, Murray owned the Able Machine Shop, A B L E, always better lasting equipment, a small company that imported lathes and drills from England. But in his heart, he considered himself a songwriter. He had been writing songs since he was a teenager, and after many years of dogged pursuit, one or two of his songs had actually been recorded. But according to his wife Audrey, his songs just died. They never did anything. Yet Murray's love for music was still his abiding passion. The very sound of music soothed him. He would close his eyes and tilt his head back, losing himself in the melody and chord changes, which seemed to transport him someplace joyous and peaceful. He especially liked to hear one of his own compositions playing on the hi-fi as he lay in the small dark bedroom of his modest Hawthorne Los Angeles bungalow. Dennis, his voice boomed through the house. Put it on again. In the modern pink kitchen at the rear of the house, Murray's thirteen-year-old middle son Dennis sat stubbornly at the dinette table. His face knotted in pure resentment. He was a thin, wiry adolescent, athletically built, his sun-bleached blond hair electric razored into a flat-top crew cut. He remained at the table, purposely ignoring his father. Dennis and his father were the family antagonists, although Murray was often at odds with all three of his sons. In many ways, Dennis and Murray were the most alike. Fiercely loyal and devoted to each other, they were totally unable to express their feelings. Instead, they seemed to be locked into some terrible competitive duel. On the surface, it appeared to be a typical generation gap of the late fifties, with Murray's tough depression mentality and hard work ethics pitted against Dennis's casual California teen sensibility. But the passions between this father and son went well beyond any ordinary generation gap. Audrey Wilson gingerly turned the bacon strips in a frying pan at the stove. A pleasant and cheerful young housewife, she was in the pressure spot of mediating the daily turmoil between her husband and three sons. Looking anxiously at Dennis, she said to him, "Go ahead, Dennis, put it on for him." Slightly plump, with blonde hair and a warm smile, Audrey made the kitchen her domain and salvation. Food was a major preoccupation in the Wilson household for every one but Dennis, and the kitchen was the center of household activity. It was also by far the most modern room in the simply appointed bungalow. Facing the rear of the house, with a small garden beyond, the kitchen had been remodeled by Murray on several occasions. It now sported new cabinets and appliances, including a dishwasher and a two-door refrigerator, making it look like the kitchen of a much larger, more expensive house, like the set from a suburban TV sitcom. Dennis looked at his mother and groaned. "Oh, Ma, do I have to?" he asked. He went to the small monophonic record player in the music room and put the stylus back to the beginning of the spinning seventy-eight disc. Dennis thought all this music writing stuff was stupid. Just one listen, and you could tell Murray couldn't write a fucking good tune. That he was a frustrated piece of shit writer. Murray couldn't even play an instrument, but Murray could pick out chords on the piano. And despite Dennis's critical opinion of him, many people thought he wrote beautiful melodies. His musical ideas did seem a bit corny, if not downright anachronistic. Murray first took songwriting seriously as a teenager when he entered one of his compositions in a New York radio contest that was aired in Los Angeles. Over the years, his songs were turned down hundreds of times, and on occasion he was cheated outright by unethical publishers, as when he wrote the lyrics to an obscure single for which he claimed he was never paid. But the small group of Murray's tunes that were published and recorded gave him supreme pleasure. 
One of Murray's favorites was Jimmy Haskell singing Murray's "Hide My Tears" on Palace Records. Another was the Fiesta Day Polka. Perhaps Murray's all-time favorite was the record on the phonograph in the family room, Two Step Side Step, which was recorded by a group called The Bachelors on Palace Records. It was an upbeat hillbilly tune that Lawrence Welk, then at the height of his fame, once played on live radio. There was even sheet music for it, and Murray was so certain the song would sweep the nation, he invented a little side-stepping dance that went with it. But the cha-cha and the merengue were the big popular dances at the time, and two-step side-step was hardly noticed. When the record ended this time, Murray called out to Dennis once more, "Play it again! Play it again!" And Dennis, a little more resentfully, put the needle back to the start. Two. Murray had something of a hyperactive personality. He had a commanding voice and spoke so forcefully that he was at once galvanizing and irritating. His speech cadence had all the energy of a tough football coach cussing out his team. Five feet ten inches tall, balding, overweight, he had the air of a desperate salesman. Actually, Murray was a very good salesman. One of his neighbors, Joanne Marks, remembered. The only trouble was he oversold everything and then ruined it. Said another neighbor, Ida Kennedy, he was a loudmouth. Yet at heart, Murray was nothing more than the average American who believed in the American dream and achievement through hard work. Although raised as a Lutheran, he wasn't a frequent churchgoer, but he was a religious man who believed in God and heaven and hell, and he worked hard for his living. He was born Murray Gage Wilson on July 2, 1917, in Hutchinson, Kansas, on the Arkansas River, smack dab in the middle of the Middlemost State. The son of William Carl Wilson and Edith Stoll, he was third oldest of four brothers and four sisters. His father, nicknamed Bud, was a land enthusiast. Not that he ever had enough money to buy any. A plumber by trade, like his father before him, Murray's father traveled first to Montana, then to Texas, looking for a new homestead for the family, before finally moving to Escondido, California, along with the tens of thousands of other Dust Bowl families in search of the California dream. In Escondido, Bud Wilson played semi-professional baseball before the lure of better employment brought him and his large family to Los Angeles in 1922. They rented a big farmhouse at 9722 South Figueroa on the corner of 98th Street. He was very strict and struggled hard to feed eight kids during the Depression. Remembered Bud's youngest son Charles. I don't know how he survived. While Bud took whatever plumbing work he could find, including long stints in the desert helping to build the Los Angeles Aqueduct, his wife Edith worked a steam press, ironing clothes for a garment manufacturer. Most of the family's clothing was handmade by Edith, a formidable figure, five feet eight inches, and weighing over two hundred pounds. Nobody got sassy with her," said Charles. Nor with Bud. He was a hard drinker with an explosive temper, who often wreaked havoc on his large family, beating the kids and his wife. He was an ornery son of a bitch," remembered one of his sons-in-law. He punched around and beat up his wife and kids until the kids were big enough to beat him up back. On one occasion, Bud beat Charles so badly for breaking his eyeglasses that the entire family was up in arms against him. Another time, he punched Murray so sadistically that Murray finally hauled off and smacked him back. There was so much bitterness that after Edith Wilson passed away, Murray and his younger sister Emily never saw their father again, although he lived to be 92. Emily hated her father in particular for the way he treated her mother. But the other children had fonder memories of Bud Wilson, including the nightly family sing-alongs around the old upright piano Bud and Edith had saved up to buy secondhand. Often the younger kids would fall asleep listening to their parents singing in the living room. Mary was an active, curious child, always into some mischief, but good-natured with a soft side. He was so sensitive that he would cry if someone was mean to him. He met Audrey Corthoff at Washington High School in Los Angeles. Born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, Audrey came to California in 1928 with her mother and father, Betty and Carl Corthoff, when she was 10 years old. Her family settled in downtown Los Angeles, where her grandfather and father were both bakers. Eventually, her father opened his own bake shop, the Mary Jane Bakery, in Central Los Angeles. Audrey was a pretty girl, already a bit overweight, but cheerful and warm. Mary fell for her instantly. 
They had in common a great love of music. Audrey belonged to the school glee club and had a beautiful singing voice, an attribute that was of no small importance to Murray Wilson. They were married on March 26, 1938, and moved to a small apartment at 8012 South Harvard Boulevard, where they were living when Audrey gave birth to their first son, Brian Douglas Wilson, on June 20, 1942, at Sentinella Hospital in Inglewood. When Brian was born, I was one of those young, frightened fathers, Murray Wilson once said, but I just fell in love with him, and in three weeks he cooed back at me. Their second son, Dennis Carl, was born December 4th, 1944, and a third son, Carl Dean, was born on December 21st, 1946. Three months after Dennis's birth, the family moved to the South Bay community of Hawthorne. With a hard-earned and harder-saved $2,300 down payment, they bought a small, neat, two-bedroom house at 3701 West 119th Street on the corner of Cornbloom Avenue. Located just three blocks north of the Hawthorne Airport, where light planes would land and take off, the community was a barren tract with no trees for shade. There weren't even any sidewalks. The front lawns just tapered off into the street where the newly dug sewer lines had been put in. Because the house had only two bedrooms, all three boys slept in the same 12 by 10 foot room, with one small window overlooking Cornbloom Avenue. The Wilsons were hardly out of place in Hawthorne, the city of good neighbors. It was one of the many new and burgeoning communities of young marrieds and new families that had sprung up throughout the South Bay area just after the war. Twelve miles southeast of central Los Angeles, the small community didn't have electrical power until 1910, or even a police department until 1922. Nearly half of the population was on relief during the 30s, and the working-class residents almost all declared bankruptcy. Almost 3,000 parcels of property were sold off for delinquent taxes, some at one dollar each. The community was virtually saved in 1939 by the Northrop Aircraft Company, which opened offices there and brought with it dozens of contractors and 20,000 jobs. By the time the Wilsons arrived in Hawthorne during the post-war urban sprawl, it was still a predominantly white working-class community. Flat, bleak, hot, it comprised seemingly endless patches of development homes laid end to end, street after street, row after row of duplicate tract houses, available for under $10,000 each. It was a community of mahjong and checkers, foster frees, supermarkets, churches, little league, and cookouts on Sundays. It was the essence of Heartland Los Angeles, and if there was anything unusual about Hawthorne, it was that it was the most benignly typical Los Angeles suburb you could find. Murray worked as a clerk for the Southern California Gas Company, and later at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. One day at the plant, when he was working near a high-power machine that conditioned rubber with acid, one of the swabs of acid flew across the room and hit him in the face. It splintered his glasses and completely burned out his left eye. Murray spent two weeks in the hospital, followed by long months despairing at home. He was fitted with a glass eye, but the scarred socket was too sensitive at first for him to be able to wear it, and Murray sported an eye patch for a time. When I was twenty-five, I thought the world owed me a living, Murray said. When I lost my eye, I tried harder, drove harder, and did the work of two men in the company, and got more raises. End of Side One